Welcome to the Disruptor Series Podcast, 3% Conference Special Edition. We're celebrating the 10th anniversary of 3% with incredible guests and powerful conversations with people who are disrupting business, culture, and life. Here are your hosts, Asha Davis and Rob Schwartz. Well, thank you for tuning in. We're really excited to celebrate one of the world's most disruptive forces, the 3% Conference. And on today's show, we're thrilled to speak with two disruptive leaders, Katrine Dubois, who heads up TBWA Media Arts Lab, the bespoke creative agency for Apple, and Nancy Reyes, the CEO of legendary creative agency, TBWA Shiat in New York. Katrine, Nancy, welcome to this special 3% conference edition of the Disruptor Series podcast. Great to be here. My dog is very excited, so I'm apologizing in front. <laughs> we love that. We can, we can interview the dog too, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're here at the 10th anniversary of the 3% conference. And, you know, and I think just, you know, thinking about this, I mean, could you imagine 10 years ago, we'd have this many female leaders uh, in the advertising business? I mean, Nancy, like, I mean, was this even possible in 2011? It was always possible. Uh, whether or not enough people believed it is a whole other story. So I, I agree with you, Rob. I think it's been it's been a long time coming. It's a big it's a big sea change. I can feel it. I'm sure Katrine can feel it. We can see it. Um, it was always possible. It's just nice that it's being recognized and, and that companies are doing something about it now. I mean, Rob, would it have been possible that we have a female co-host on Disruptor series? You know. <laughs> First of all, let me just tell you, 10 years ago, no one had conceived of a podcast. <laughs> it was just it was just radio then. It wasn't this thing. So I think the people at Apple did, but what else? Uh, so <laughs> I am always thrilled to have you ride shotgun, Asha, anytime. <laughs> um, so speaking of celebrations and celebrating awesome, powerful women, you know, uh, Nancy, you were recently uh, recognized by Ad Color um, as a legend in this industry. So first of all, huge congratulations from the whole Disruptor Series team. Um, but we're curious, you know, what do you think actually makes somebody a legend in this business? Thank you, Asha. Um, that means a lot. And, and I think this Legend Award means a lot, although I'm, I'm not fully, I, I can't even believe I, I got it, I have to say. I, I think the, the idea with the Legend or just sort of ever kind of getting awarded something like that is that you, you're leaving an imprint on an industry that will make it better than when you entered it or when you found it. That's that's how I internalize the Ad Color Legends Award. When I first started in this business now, uh, my God, a really long time ago, I feel like it's 25, almost 25 years ago, there weren't a whole lot of people who looked like me in the business, um, certainly not at the highest levels. And so the idea that noticing that, getting into a position where I could contribute to that, change it, fix it, pull up people um, as, I, as I rose, that's what it means to me. So now when we look at the industry, the shape of it looks different, uh, certainly from a female perspective, from people of color, from underrepresented communities, it looks different um, than, than 25 years ago. Still a long way to go, but, but that's, that's to me legend. Do we leave this place different than when we, than when we began? Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I think that that holds true in so many uh, industries as well. You know, that that's probably one of the best descriptions of what a legend means that, that I've heard, certainly. Um, Katrine, you lead what is arguably one of the most coveted pieces of business in the entire industry, uh, particularly in advertising. And that, of course, is Apple, as we heard Rob uh, intro before. You know, based on what we're seeing, obviously you're doing an amazing, amazing job. You know, Apple continues to be the Apple of everyone's eye when we ask, you know, what are our favorite ads. Um, you know, in your, from your perspective, you know, what's the best part of uh, playing a leadership role uh, on one of the world's most iconic brands? I think it's um, anyone who works at Media Arts Lab, whether you're in a leadership position or not, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. And we actually use that a lot and we say that a lot. And um, and I think in many ways that is the best part of the job because it gives you huge responsibility, um, also huge pressure because you don't want to mess it up, right? You want to continue the legacy that was created by all those incredible people that went before us. And uh, you want to, they put the bar so high, uh, but inevitably um, 
myself and, and all the leaders within Media Arts Lab, all we want to do is raise the bar, right? And con constantly keep raising the bar. So I definitely, I definitely think it's uh, continuing the legacy and having the privilege of continuing the legacy uh, of Media Arts Lab is what the best part of uh, being a leader there is. Hey, hey, one, one piece on, on the standing on the shoulders of giants. I, I love how you, how you phrase that, Katrine. I was talking to somebody about uh, 1984, the spot specifically, the actual 60 seconds of film. And when you think about it, again, uh, here we are at 3%. In 1983, when they were producing 1984, somebody was smart enough to make the hero of the spot a woman. Yep. You know, when we think about the spot, it's the woman who throws uh, the sledgehammer. So uh, there's something in the DNA of Apple that uh, really was thinking about the future even back then. So I, I don't know, maybe there's there's something that you're experiencing when you work with Apple that kind of understands, uh, I don't know, how to do things the right way. Definitely, I, I, th I think they, they as clients, I think we as an agency are pretty um, forward thinking in terms of what the shape of an agency should look like. Uh, what the makeup of the talent should be, uh, what the gender makeup should be, what uh, all, all of it, right? The, the diversity of our talents is critical to what we are as an agency. And we've got some way to go um, in where we are today and where we need to get going. Um, and I guess the first step in that is accepting that you have uh, more changes to make, but that you're willing to put the effort into it and the work into it to make the changes. So, um, so I think, yes, 1983 slash 1984 um, set the tone and I think when you look at the makeup of Media Arts Lab now, we are 60% female. So it's a, it's a heavily female skewed uh, leadership team uh, in the agency now. Wow. So Media Arts Lab and Apple think different, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're here to really discuss that um, next decade uh, of disruption in leadership, particularly, um, and something that I, I'm, I'm very excited about, and, and you uh, both are fantastic examples of, of what that uh, next decade uh, will look like. You know, I think you're both giants that folks like me would be honored to stand on the shoulders of, you know, um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's really interesting, as we talked about, because this episode is kind of actually meta because we are disrupting the norm again as we talked about before of you know this all female you know boss panel you know um in your opinions and, and this is a, a question uh katrine both for you and nancy um you know what are in your opinions are there differences between male and female leadership you know uh or do you think that it's more individual based versus gender just curious to hear your thoughts there it's a personal answer, right? And it's a personal opinion because I think studies have proven, have proven both sides, right? That there isn't or that there is. I think, um, I think as females, what I feel we've come a long way in the last decades is that we, I don't ever feel like I have to behave like a male. That was not the case uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, when I was a junior person on an all-male team, uh, I think I was definitely the odd person out and I had to behave like a male, which, you know, has, has had repercussions on my swearing habits in later life. So I think for me, the critical part is that we are more and more allowed and need to be who we are as humans. And therefore that is bringing a different type of leadership in, in, in any industry, right? So whether it's advertising or, or any industry. And so I think that is, that, that, that's changing things. And I think that's for me, the most liberating thing is seeing not just myself, um, but the people in the agency being able to be themselves and, and, and bringing the female side to the equation, to the table of leadership. Yeah, I agree with Katrine that it's an individual or a personal a personal response. And you know, I, I think I've also read the, the the science and the business studies on the differences between male and, and female leadership. I think I I, I prefer to think about um, us as modern leaders. I heard somebody talk about it that way the other day, and that resonated more with me than the than than when people discuss the differences between male leadership and female leadership. And by modern leadership, I mean um, leadership that is more transformational in nature. Um, you know, many modern leaders are looking to change the dynamics or change the systems in which we've operated or we've come to accept as just that's just the norm. So I think many modern leaders are challenging uh, those systemic. Uh, I think 
concepts, behaviors, and, and beliefs. Um, they are more team based, I think. You know, that is something again that is that is more me um, than than maybe other people. I, I feel like I lead with a team. Um, I believe in um, self governed teams, empowering teams of people when they're great. Let's let's make sure to support them and develop them and grow them more when they're not great let's figure out what's wrong with them but that's what i think of modern leadership it requires a, a significant uh, emphasis um, and passion for teams because teams are what drive change and transformation and that's where i think we are right now on the precipice of just what's the new way of operating what's the new way of leading what's the new way of organizing and behaving as an organization I will say though, as 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 a dude leader, and of course Nancy, you and I work closely together. Um, I think I did learn some things from Nancy that I wasn't doing uh, at least uh, instinctively, uh, like asking someone else's opinion. I think that there was, uh, you know, what Nancy brought to me, uh, and what ultimately I think happened for our team was, uh, I felt less uh, like I had to have every answer. And she kind of reminded me that not only do you not need to have every answer, but your answer is probably not as good as what the collective wisdom is going to be. So why don't you kind of open some things up? So I think that there were some just maybe very natural things that I think, you know, and again, as I've talked to, you know, other leaders that there were some things just that, that, that were not more natural to, to female leadership, which I think is more in line with, with what Nancy calls modern leadership. So. So thank you for that. I agree with that. And I think the, the description of modern leadership is great, Nancy. And I agree that there's maybe um, character traits within females that are more akin to that type of leadership. But I think it's hard to say female leaders are better than male leaders or because it is so individual, right? And I've, and I've known a lot of male leaders that have been brilliant and that have been brilliant at listening to the group and to the team and been, been able to do that. And there's been others <laughs> ones that were completely incapable of doing that, right? But um, so, so, I, so I think, yes, I definitely agree that female traits are, um, are more akin to modern leadership sort of on paper. Yeah, and it, it's interesting kind of, you know, being on the, the, the flip side for for uh, a better part of my career you know having been led by you know both male and female leaders and kind of seeing that shift as well like Katrina as you talked about you know quote unquote the old days you know where a lot of times you know you would be the the only woman on an all-male team it, depending on kind of the industry you're, you're in and, and even quite frankly the types of clients you're working on right and that you know unsaid or unspoken pressure to feel like if you want to excel and move up that you have to you know suppress some of the things that might come natural to you and and act in this this way you know and, and even when you would read books you know if, depending on the year it was written and it's like what makes a leader or things like that a lot of them are are male sort of dominant male traits or male skills in terms of being, you know, extra assertive. And even if you don't know, pretend you don't know, it almost felt a little Machiavellian type of thing, you know, um, and, and sort of experiencing and seeing that shift um, throughout my career, you know, my, my career is about, you know, um, 11, 12 years at this point, you know, and, and so I've actually kind of seen some of that shift in, in real life, you know, it, it has been, uh, honestly quite wonderful to see you know um and, and to to feel a little bit more cared for and, and heard you know by by some of the leaders um, that i've worked with you know um but you know despite all that and despite the rise of amazing leaders like yourselves you know that that old school mentality is not eradicated you know and and, and actually it still feels like it's more prevalent than not, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, and, and so that it's this hierarchical command and control, like I'm the boss and you're not. And, and that, that feeling where, you know, someone is basically trying to lord power over the people that they have power over, you know, that, that feels uh, gross, you know, to be honest, when you're on the receiving end of that, you know, and I'm sure, you know, feeling pressure to be that type of leader, if that's not what naturally comes to you, I'm, I'm sure is not a great feeling either, you know, and so that 
it, 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 and in that manner, in the fact that you kind of see that as the norm, it hasn't really lost its relevance yet, you know, because there are still a whole stream of people that still think that that's the way that you're supposed to be. Those modern leadership books have not, you know, gotten to to the majority of leaders. And so I'm curious to, to, to know, A, do you guys, you know, agree with the sentiment that this is still kind of prevalent or and the norm? And, and if so, kind of why do you think that that might be? Yeah, I, I would say I would agree with you, Asha, that I think it's absolutely still around. That's, that's probably why it feels so hard to lead in this new modern way because we're pushing up against an accepted an accepted system. So I think like a lot of challenges that we face, it's a journey and it's going to take a while. And you know, I think I've come to the terms, come to terms with the fact that I'm probably going to not, you know, not live to see it completely eradicated and changed. You know, it goes back to are, are we leaving it better than, you know, than we started. I think I read some HBR article that said in order to get it to be sort of, you know, true quality between men and women and have both ways of leading or multiple ways of leading be, be the norm, we're about 200 years away from that. Um, you know, wow. I mean, that's, that's kind of what happens when you have systems that just require so much, you have to overwork and overtrain the brain to bring consciousness to it versus something that now behaves intuitively. But the more, the more we have women leaders, the more they'll bring up more women leaders, the more that they'll bring up more women leaders and we'll start to behave in a way that feels more intuitive versus is more sort of, I have to think about it. I have to make sure I'm consciously doing something different. But I, I think we're on a journey and it, and it sounds alarming sometimes to say that 200 year number, but I actually think it also sounds a little sobering because when you face or when I face the daily challenge of trying to change the system, I remind myself, I don't know what part of the 200 year journey I'm on, but you know, I, I don't think I'm on a hundred year, 199, <laughs> you know, like we're, we're, we're somewhere in this thing. So it's not meant to be perfect, but the fact that it's hard Hard means that that it's working, that it's that we're trying to change it, that we're running up against the exact thing that we're trying to to push up against and change. Right. If I look back at ten, imagine ten years ago, and I'm you know I remember sort of sitting in an office with whatever five male leaders and being the only female. Like we've come a long way. So there is, I think, we have to take there's hope right the the progress that has been made in terms of types of leadership and the it, it, in my sphere anyway right in uh, the diminishing prevalence of command and control i think gives me hope that we are moving in the right direction and that it's going to go keep moving in that direction i cannot see a world where we're going backwards to where command and control is deemed to be the new norm and the way forward, right? I do think at times, even as female, particularly maybe even as female leaders, we have to be careful that there is a difference between command and control and hierarchy. I think we do all work in organizations that have a some type of hierarchy, right? Some flatter than others. Um, and there are people at the top of those trees that are needing to make decisions for the greater good of the business. Now, we might agree with those or not agree with those, but that's ultimately kind of what we work, you know, the ecosystem we work with. And I think sometimes what I have found, at least, is that sometimes there's um, th those lines blur a little bit. And I, and I think a leadership style of command and control is very different to a, hi a hierarchy in an organization that you are going to get, you know, whether you work in Sweden or whether you work in, in, in America. Um, and I, I think it's important to distinct between the two. Yeah, I, I think Katrina, I think you make, you make a, a good point. And I think we have to move, uh, you know, from, from hierarchical to what I would call collaborarchical. Collaborate. Meaning that you still have the hierarchy, but, but, but the collaboration pieces, uh, and, and the way of collaboration uh, works, but you still have, a, a, you know, the key decision maker. Yeah. One thing I was going to point out is that I feel like so many of our systems, and oh my God, Nancy, 200 years, I can't, that's, <laughs> that's a long time. There, there's no, there's no, there's not enough, you know, uh, chirogenics in the world that we're going to be around for that one. Uh, but uh, I think some of these structures in these companies come from the military. So I think as, as you look towards how military is, you know, changing and military is going, you know, kind of more 
uh, you know, less command and control and more into these different cells and these different areas, you know, within worlds of different cyber and all that good stuff. Uh, it is more collaborative. It is less uh, general to troops. And there's more of a, I don't know, kind of an interesting uh, platoon uh, system with, with a leader who ultimately makes a decision. Something like that. I'm curious, actually, um, uh, Nancy and Katrine, you know, we, we're talking a little bit about hierarchy here and something that folks, I think, sometimes forget, regardless if you're, you know, the CEO, president, managing director, whatever, you still have a boss somewhere. You know, there's still someone that you got to, you know, for lack of a better word, report to, you know, or that you're still accountable to. And I'm curious, you know, how do you you know, or do you switch that up? You know, do you, do you change your approach when you're dealing with, you know, someone that, that you're accountable to or, or a leader versus when you are, you know, leading your, your teams and your offices? I think it's a great question. Um, I, and I, 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 I mean, I don't know for Nancy, but I think for me personally, I, it, it's, um, it's, very, it's a very deliberate decision that I made many, many years ago. Um, and I was at TBWA in London, in fact, when I made this decision because of a male boss that I had at the time. Um, that the way I'm talking to you now, Asha, yeah. is the way that I talk to Tor Marin at Apple. It's the way that I talk to Troy Rohane, and it's the way that I talk to an account exec in the building at Media Arts Lab. It's the way that I talk to someone in China, to Singapore. To them. Like, I, I think I have to be true to who I am and what my beliefs and my values are and convey those in the most effective way rather than change who, who I am depending on who I'm talking to. I think it, it's a very bizarre maybe as it might seem but it was a very conscious decision that I made uh, because I saw someone not doing that and felt it was disingenuous and I think um, I think there has to be a an authenticity to leadership uh, that breeds trust and I think trust is so critical in the jobs that we do that I wouldn't want to be a different person in front of different people in the organization that I have to deal with. Mm. I think that's such a brilliant way to articulate it, Katrine. I love that. I love that. I think that one of the things that I've learned more as I've grown is to be more vulnerable, which I think would classically be defined as a more female leadership characteristic and the, the benefits of that vulnerability, you know, to be sort of, you know, I think, I think somebody told me once, we don't have two lives, we have one life. We, we don't have this personal life over here and this business life over there, we just have one life. And so the idea that we would fluidly go between those two and, and expose some of those vulnerabilities that we have, including the, I don't have the answer, I don't know. Uh, you know, those kinds of things I think are important. I, you know, in, in maybe 10 years ago, I would say, if I was going to be in front of my boss, I have to act with the utmost confidence. I have to be so certain of every answer. I have to go in there saying, this is the way that it is, and this is what I believe, and there's no refuting what I'm saying. I think in today's world, the thing that I end up leaning into the most is just the, the, the honesty and the vulnerability that comes with honesty. This is what I know. This is what I don't know. This is what I'm trying to figure out. You know, This is what I think I'm gonna do. This is where I need help. Like There is nothing wrong with exposing what you know and what you don't know to both the people that you serve and the boss that you report into. Yeah, that that that's great. It's kind of, you know, it's it, it I love uh Katrine what you had said as well about sort of that authenticity, you know, across uh, across the, those aspects and and yeah, Nancy to your point, it's it would it's very taxing to try to be all of these different people, you know, at, at all of the times. It's it's akin to you know something that is relevant to a, a lot of folks of color like myself around code switching, right? And you know when when you work in a place where you don't feel like you have to do that, your quality of life is you know much better you know because it's it's very mentally taxing to feel that you have to be all these different um people depending on who you're talking to right so let, let's talk a little bit about something that that doesn't describe either of you at all the world's worst bosses you know um so i'm i'm curious to know you know 
about the worst bosses that you've ever worked with. Obviously, we're not naming names here at all. Um, but you know, where did you see things go awry? Um, you know, and what, if anything, did you learn from them? And this could be bosses that either you worked under or they may have been, you know, peers uh, to you as well. I have one kind of little salacious, you know, tidbit to share, and then one that maybe is is a little bit more normal. <laughs> but I, you know, really early on in my career, I had. Um, and I didn't know that this boss did that, but um, I didn't know the answer. So I, you know, I came into advertising through a program. I didn't grow up wanting to be in advertising. I didn't know the first thing about advertising. So I, I arrived at my job, and you know, my boss would tell me to do all sorts of things. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking. I mean, I don't. What do you? What do you? What is a PDF? Why would I? Who is this? What is a creative director? And why would I go get a logo from this person? Like, it just none, nothing made sense. So I would ask the question. I would say, "Okay, well, who is, who is that person? And and when I when I get that logo, what am I asking for? What is the use of that?" And you know, she would sort of quickly run through the answer to that. I would never be able to capture it all. And then she would hang up the phone, and she would say, "Idiot, oh, stupid." And I, of course, I didn't know that because I was someplace else, but I had a colleague who happened to hear this interaction every time. And he came and said to me, you know what, every time you ask a question, she's calling you an idiot. She's calling you stupid. And that to me, I mean, it's, it, I was young, you know, and maybe I was asking questions that were super annoying, but that's one of the worst things that we can do to somebody, you know, who's young, um, who doesn't come from this, who wouldn't know anything about advertising is to make them feel like the, the actual act of asking questions to learn more is a sign of stupidity, right? Or a sign of weakness. I want a name. I'm, I'm going to, I want to do a lot of phony phone calls to this person. <laughs> I mean, isn't that crazy? But don't you think that the whole, the, I, I think that asking questions is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness, because you expose what you don't know and you say, okay, I'm not an expert in this. I'd like to learn from you what is an expert in that. So shutting that down is really is really terrible. Um, the, the less salacious example is I had a boss who kept telling me that I was incredible and awesome and so competent and so wonderful. And I would say, but I'm struggling with this one thing. And he would say, but you, you are not struggling with that. It's fine, you're terrific, you're wonderful. Um, and I would say, I really need help. Can, is there any way that you could that you could sit down with me and help me? I can't figure that. No, you're great. You're awesome. It's the same kind of thing where that boss was likely trying to do this thing of saying you're wonderful and instilling confidence and making me feel really good about myself. But you know, it again suppressed that sort of that that moment of asking for help. You know, that moment of like, I actually, I'm, I, I, I know I'm amazing. By the way, I'm, I, I know I'm great. I just need help with this one thing. Let's not, you know, let's not make that not a not a real need that should be fulfilled. So that's, I think, for me, the biggest thing about the worst bosses. I mean, I, I gave you a really salacious one because that, that one is just a good story to tell people, and they always laugh and they're like, "Who the heck was that?" But it's the same concept of actually some of the worst bosses I've ever had leave no room for learning, leave no room for asking for help. And, and I think that their attempt is to say that you should know this so that you're perfectly competent. But what it does is it actually makes you feel even more incompetent, even more stupid. Like help is not something you're ever supposed to ask for. That's interesting. I think that's clearly a cultural thing because that happens anywhere in the world, um, including in, uh, in the UK. I think, you know what, I, it's hard to say worst bosses because I, I, I can't, I actually found it really hard to go, what's the worst boss I have? I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for any of them, right? Because to to um, Nancy's point, like even the, the guy who was going, you're amazing, you're amazing. The fact that you're aware that what he was doing wasn't helpful means that you take it in yourself to not do that, right? And so all the worst bits of people or bosses that I've had, I've definitely gone, well, I'm never gonna do it that way. And I will never do it that way. And so so there isn't, I don't think there is a worse boss. I think the, the thing that I've been, that I've been aware of for, I guess, a long time, as far as I can remember, maybe account director level or something, you know, where you start to get more senior is, um, is being able to be big and have your voice heard, but also being able to be small and listen to other people. And I think um, a lot of the bosses I had in my time were unable to do that. They were only able to be the big people.
and the people that had to be heard and seen and be the alpha male in the room and I think very early on I was like I will never be like that I will be the one that will be quiet when I need to be quiet and listen to what the people have to say um and I so so I and and I think there were a lot of those right in and we're talking like late 1990s uh early 2000s in the United Kingdom <laughs> for anyone who um uh, who's listening to this, who lived through those times, there was a lot of people who wanted to hear their own voice. Um, and so so I think that's what I learned from, to, to not repeat that. Hmm. Asha, are you uh, ready to switch gears into uh, the journeys? Yeah, for sure. Please. Th that was just really interesting to me, you know, just hearing the, not only the traits of, you know, uh, some some things that you guys went through with leaders that were not great, but also um, taking them, both of you talked about taking those as learning experiences, actually, you know, and, and helped you identify the types of leaders that you did not want to be, you know. And and I'm, I'm curious because I'm curious to know when you were first identified as a leader. You know, we, we talk about, you know, as, as Rob mentioned, we're kind of pivoting into, you know, the journey part so, so that how did you get here right and you know it's it's really interesting because you know you hear about um sometimes people tell kids or or whatever so i'm just curious of you know when were you first identified a leader as a leader just in life you know and then you know also tell us a little bit about you know when were you identified as a leader in your career? You know, were those sort of two different moments and, and kind of how you knew that being a president or a CEO could uh, possibly be something in your path? I think as a person I identified like as a leader, I think it was pretty young because I was very tall uh, and I was, you know, I, I know that's weird. <laughs> so you're right, okay. I see it in my daughter now. My daughter is turns eight uh, the day after tomorrow. She's as tall as a fifth grader, right? So she's in second grade. And it it, it means you com like you command, like it's a physical manifestation of, like it is true. And I remember, being very early on maybe second grade or whatever and always being the tallest on the on the playground and kids coming to me when something went wrong like I hurt myself wow. I'm in a fight with someone can you come and help me right and I remember that distinctly so I think that now did I think oh I'm going to be a leader no not at all I just <laughs> went to put a plaster on someone's leg but um uh, I think from a career point of view I think it's it's a sadder story in that I was not identified as a leader. Mm. Um, I, in fact, it was the opposite up until you know not that long, not mild times, not. Um, but before I came to Media Arts Lab, I, I I mean it was it was overtly said to me that I would never be more than a second in command. Wow. Um, and so, but what that but it, that's okay because again to your question before about what's the worst bosses. Like it, you know, it, no hard feelings at all. I walked away going, watch me. Right. <laughs> and then by the way, Katrine, so I mean, like, what was the reasoning that someone identified you as a second in command? Oh, I think that, I mean, we could, that's like a therapy session, right? <laughs> No, I think, uh, I think but because, those two bits, that's why people tune in. They want to right. know. I know. You know what? Because I think, you know, you know, I mean, look, in all seriousness, I think I was just very helpful to be the second person in command mm -hmm. to that person. Right. So I, I, I made the wheels turn. I made the people be want to be there. I, so, so I, I had all the qualities of someone that was helping that person be the first in command. And, um, and that but was by, by the way, that was your, that was your role though at the time. Correct. So whoever was above you just didn't, they didn't lay the path for you or you yourself felt like, hey, I feel comfortable here. Or did you want to, you know. Oh, no, a, I want to, no, I wanted to. And I wanted to help in, 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 in carving out a path uh, mm. to get to running, running an office. Um, that, but again, it, it, it was a very constructive conversation. This isn't some salacious story. This is a very, it was a very constructive conversation. Um, I'm very good friends with the person who did say it to me, but, um, but, um, but I think it wasn't a natural, whereas I felt it was my next step. Mm. There was powers at the time that felt that wasn't the case. And so you take, and therefore I did say, well, watch me. 
uh, and and you know that was an impetus for me to go and see what else was out there uh, and a little over a year after I joined media arts lab right so um there lost my game like that's fine no problem at all um but but I think it's not again it's in learning when something like that happens you go well I don't ever want that to happen to somebody mm. else and if someone came and asked me and said hey I want to go do x and I didn't feel they had the ability or or the tools or whatever then I would help them to either get there or explain that that wasn't their path and I put their path and then we can debate that but it's just it's just how it's delivered and when it's delivered that's so critical so yeah I think it's so interesting because you kind of said this earlier when it comes to like the world's worst bosses and you know really what we're talking about is like what kind of adversity did we did we face in you know in professional life that kind of you know made us flip a switch and um just to start on that note professionally i was i was at um good beat i'd been there for a year um I, I think i'd been working maybe for six years or so five five years six years and i thought i was great you know, honestly, I'd always gotten really good reviews. I, I'm like, this is awesome. I'm pretty good at what I do. And I had my one year review uh, and I was going in to speak to the managing partner who was going to give me my review. And I walked in being like, I am it really, I cannot wait to hear what I'm going to be told. And I sat down and he said one thing to me, which is you're not as great as I thought you would be. And my first reaction was, wow. well, you, neither are you. You're not as great as I thought you were. I, I got really bitchy about it. I was like, whatever. And I went home and I was really pissed off being like, I don't see think he is. I'm not as great as he thought I would be. Like, I'm not, I'm not a disappointment. And, you know, I woke up in the morning and I'm like, listen, I'm not as great as I thought I would be either. You know, this is, I, I didn't, I haven't risen, you know, but what I didn't do was recede from it. I sort of leaned into it to be like, okay, then but let's be great. You know, let's be great. I will never get that feedback again in my life and I'll never turn, I'll never look back on that. And I, that's always been, and, and to your point, Katrine, this, the person who told me um, is, you know, one of the people I regard so closely in my, in my career and I, and I love him to pieces and I still talk to him, um, you know, to this day. He doesn't remember saying that to me, by the way, which is so interesting. Like that's a lesson in like what managers say to their people sticks more with the people they say it to than the managers themselves. But he has no recollection of ever saying that. I'm like, what do you talking about i was at your desk you were wearing this like i know exactly what like what everything looked like time stood still when you said that to me so i think that was a moment i turned and again i never i sort of never looked back and i felt that morning after i had gotten some crappy feedback like this is a moment for leadership i will be a leader now like i i absolutely feel in my bones i think on a personal level you know, I think it came really young because, you know, we were we were a super uh, poor family and I had to contribute a ton to the household. And I felt like contributing to the household by, you know, we would we would pick up bottles and redeem them and so that we could put food on the table. We would cook, we would clean, we would iron clothes. I would join my mom to clean houses because we could clean more houses if I joined, you know, with her. Like all of those things started making me feel like I was a I was a contributing member. Um, I was sort of leading in a way I was in charge of the, you know, of, of how much revenue we collected, you know, collecting bottles, like it felt like a small thing, but I was a little businesswoman and I was leading in that way. So I think from a young age, I'm, you know, six, seven, eight, I felt like I have the ability to contribute in a big way that makes a big impact, which at that point in time, I considered, you know, leadership. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, like Katrina, I had no idea I was going to end up being a CEO, but I could tell that if I did something and if I worked really hard at it, um, I could see the impact of it. And I liked the way that felt. I liked feeling like I earned the seat at the table, I earned the food on the table that day. That made me feel really good, really valuable. And, and like I was contributing something incredibly important. I know that could have put you on the CFO path. So I'm right. glad that <laughs> something uh, required to go elsewhere. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting that both of you guys talk about being identified basically as children, right, as, as leaders. Now, I'm curious, do you guys think that leaders are born or do you think that leadership is something that can be, a, can be taught, you know, into adulthood? Wow, I don't know if I have a really strong opinion on that. I, I do think that, um, I guess I would answer it this way to say, you can stop a leader from becoming a leader really early in life if you're not careful. Like I do think people say, 
just the, the wrong things sometimes. And that could, combined with a bunch of other factors, totally prevent somebody from rising to, to you know, to the greatness they were, they were, they were destined to become had they not run into some of those people. So I, you know, I feel like some, some traits I think are things that we learn really young in life. I'll say that versus being born with it or, um, or learning it. Some things we, we, we are exposed to and we learn early in life. Um, and then other things we sort of grow into based on the bosses that we have, the people that we work with, you know, uh, what suits our passion. But I, you know, I do, I do think people can say the, the most um, damaging things to people when they're young. Um, and that, that can often define whether or not someone becomes a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I think it can be both, but I think it's, it's more what well, the uh, averse um, reaction you can have if you, if you push someone the other way, but, but I think you can learn it. I think it is, it's a really difficult question. It's like, sure, there must be some scientific proof for it, maybe, but um, I don't, yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. Listen, let, let, let me just simplify for you, Asha. The answer is they are born because Nancy and I were, we have the same birthday, August 14th. <laughs> we're, both, we, we're, both, we're both Leos. And if you look at our horoscope, you know, it says born leaders. So, you know, <laughs> just check your horoscope, done. <laughs> I love it. I'll take that. That's a good answer. <laughs> check, check your horoscope. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm December 14th, so I'm, I'm in the mix. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, got, you, got the, you got the number right. That's okay. <laughs> No, but it's interesting though that you guys say that because uh, I totally that that totally makes sense, you know. And, and not only can someone, you know, as Nancy as you put it, you know, maybe prevent somebody from from becoming a leader depending on what we say to them or or how what their experience might be as a child, but also that also ingrains in them the ability to take in, as an adult to take something negative that someone might say, you know, both Katrine and, and Nancy, you guys both mentioned times where someone said, you know, you're not as good as I thought you'd be, or you're not going to be, you know, anything more than the second in command and use that as fuel to say, you know, actually let me prove you wrong, which is, you know, something that athletes do all the time. You know, obviously, you know, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, you know, you, you remember, you know, these stories of, of, uh, of how they channeled that into championships, you know? And so um, really, really, really interesting, you know? Um, Nancy, you know, you've spoken, you know, you just told us a little bit, you know, about what life was like growing up. And, and recently um, you've, you've spoken a lot about um, your heritage as growing up as part of, you know, the Latin American uh, Hispanic community. Obviously we, we've um, just come to the end of a Hispanic uh, Heritage Month uh, coming up soon. And so, you know, what, if any, uh, role does ethnicity or, you know, color play in someone's position as a leader? Yeah, this is a really good question. And um, I've definitely been doing a lot of soul searching and talking about some of the, some of the, um, I think the challenges that I'm facing just as I'm doing a little bit of self-discovery. So, you know, earlier, Asha, you talked about suppression and I, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about, I grew up in the seventies and eighties when, um, assimilation was the key to survival. You know, that was just what we did. My mother was from El Salvador. My father, my father was from Puerto Rico. My mother brought people in from El Salvador that were staying in our basement. And it was like lay low keep your head down and just try to be like them. I mean, that was, that was the whole point, right? And there was a, sur a survival reason for that. If we, if we stuck out too much, if we were too Salvadorian, you know, La Migra, the immigration would come and scoop us up and send us out, right? That was, even, even if I was a citizen, that was sort of the perceived threat that we had. And so for, for all the years that I can remember, was out, you know, without assimilation. Um, you know, I, I was meant to blend in and, and be like everybody else. And then you, you know, you talk about the times today where we're talking about bringing our authentic selves to work, bring our, for, you know, bring, you, let's celebrate that you're Latina, that you're part of the Latinx community. And I have said, you know, quite publicly to, to the company is, you know, Asha and, and Rob, no, I don't, I don't know what that is. Right. I don't know what that means because is that the thing that I left behind when I assimilated whatever, you know, 40 years ago or like, 
what, what are you talking? I don't know what that means. And it's a really scary thing to admit to a ton of people who are growing up in this new generation in which bringing your, your ethnicity, bringing your gender, bringing your identity into work is something that is celebrated. We're having more and more conversations about it. It is welcomed. I think people are looking for more leaders that come from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds. All of that is a positive for us. But when you grew up in a generation like I did, where you were supposed to push that stuff under, it's very difficult to all of a sudden be like, here I am. I don't, I, it doesn't even come out. <laughs> like, I don't even know what that is. So I, I'm telling you the personal side of it because I see something happening, even though I may not be participating in it as much. Um, I do think that we live in a world where we can talk about this stuff. I wouldn't dare say this. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because I was trying to play up like I was a part of everybody else and not my own thing. So that would have never been an accepted conversation. So I do think we live in a world where bringing our authentic selves to work means what I just said, not just bringing the full expression of your ethnicity or your identity or your gender you know, to where you come. So I, I do, I see a path. I see a place that feels more welcoming, more safe to have these kind of conversations. I think we are richer as a result of having more diverse leaders mm -hmm. for sure. And and I think people are welcoming that um, and, and seeing the benefits of it. But I do think, especially as we're looking at a, gener a Gen X group of people coming into leadership positions, we're going to face this identity situation that many of us have. It's, it's pretty common for anybody from a Latin background, you know, around my age, which is which is 46, to have these kinds of feelings of, you know, not knowing really who we are deep down inside. I think there's, there's, there's something... Uh about our business, the advertising business that I, I think at this juncture, you know, bears to be looked at, which is advertising got interesting when advertising had different voices. So when you look at the creative revolution, the creative revolution was driven uh, not by the WASP culture that was there. The creative revolution was in reaction to that. So when you had Italians and Greeks and Jews bringing their culture into advertising, suddenly you got spicy, spicy meatball. Suddenly things got interesting because wait, that's funny. That that I've never seen that before. And when you look at advertising, I, I you know I would look at the '90s when you have this very interesting, uh, you know, when when black culture you know infects advertising in the best way possible. When you look at Lil Penny or you look at Nike Freestyle, we had not seen this before, and suddenly we're like, that's cool. I love that. So. We have to be open in our business, I think, to, uh, you know, different cultures because different cultures uh, or outside cultures, that's what creates uh, interesting things in mainstream culture. Yeah, for sure. And I think I think there's also the added nuance. And, and Nancy, you kind of touched on this a little bit of like you know, even as much as our industry might embrace this level of authenticity, sometimes it's it's weird because your family, who's from that previous generation, is not really understanding why you would be acting the same way at work that you would be acting at home. You know, yep. and they would not support you saying that. You know what I mean? And so you also don't necessarily have that support system, especially when your culture you look different, you know what I mean? So that assimilation is not necessarily as, you know, quote unquote easy, you know what I mean? And so I think there, there's, there's two things. It's kind of also our industry accepting it, but also, you know, us as individuals, you know, letting our family in on this and, you know, maybe even helping the older generations dispel some of, you know, those things that they've kind of got um, ingrained in their minds, you know? So true. You know, Katrine, it's it's interesting because you're European, as you've mentioned a couple times now, and, and obviously living uh, in the U.S. Um, I'm curious to know how your experiences as a leader in Europe um, have differed from from those in the U.S. Obviously, you know, you uh, talked a little bit about kind of leadership styles in the U.K., but you know, I'm sure that you're noticing nuances um, since you've kind of been in the U.S. And do you think that? you know, America requires a different type of leadership style, perhaps, or, you know, were there differences, for example, in terms of recognizing, you know, the importance of diversity, for example, or is it sort of the same? Just curious to kind of know your thoughts. I, I Look, I've been gone from the U.S. Uh, I've been in the U.S. now for four years. So, so you know, I, things are progressing rapidly, right? Particularly in the last two years, I think there's been so many questions asked of leaders. 
that um, and that's happening everywhere in the world like or, or particularly at least in Europe and in, in the US I think it's it's happening um so I don't know to what to what degree like how fast it is happening in Europe but I I think um so I think the same questions are being asked globally like I will you know when I talk to the managing director our managing director in Japan he's facing to varying degrees the same questions as were being asked in the U.S. uh, in the U.S. yes China is the same, right? And and I think what's really fascinating is when I, whenever I talk to all of them, which is at least once a week, is they will say, well, in China, it's like this. And I can reassure them, believe me, it's not just China. This is happening everywhere in the world, right? It's just in varying degrees. That, that's the only difference. So I think from a leadership point of view, are there differences? Yes, but I think the differences are cultural. Mm-hmm. And I think the cultural nuance is so important, right? It's like coming into a different country, it is so critical to just be an observer for a while and to accept that you don't know what it's like. I had never lived in the US before. I'd been on holiday, that's as much as I could tick off my list. Um, but um, just being accepting that, um, things happen in a different way. And some of those things being from the north of Belgium, some of the things are frustrating <laughs> because of the directness of the northern Belgians. But, and some of those things are, you kind of learn why they have value. I think the, the there's a book by Aaron Meyer called The Culture Map. Um, for anyone who hasn't read it, it's absolutely brilliant. There's actually a podcast our, the Armchair Expert podcast has her. It's an hour podcast. It's in the last 24 months. It's the best podcast I listen to because she's fascinating and she sort of lays it out. The differences globally in leadership styles. Uh, and I think it's cultural differences. And, and so that's, the, the I guess that's the biggest, been the big, biggest lesson for me coming into a different culture and accepting that. And particularly when you come into the US, you think you know it. Yeah. Because you've seen the movies and you listen to the music and therefore you think you know it, but you don't really, right? Because there's a big difference between working with people and watching a film. Yeah, I mean, being from Canada, I totally agree. I mean, I thought I, you know, I've been to New York a hundred times, you know, <laughs> it's right there. And then I moved here, I'm like, oh, this is not the same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're about to sort of uh, reach our close. And so this is where uh, we leave our listeners with a piece of advice, you know, and uh, since we've got two of you today, we are going to uh, leave our listeners with two pieces of advice. Um, And so the first is, uh, what advice would you both give to current leaders looking to elevate their relationships with their team and their business partners? I would say, um, learn to listen and trust. I think that's the number one thing we can tell, you know, leaders is, you know, to Rob's point, we don't know all the answers, but surround yourself with people that do and then listen in to what they have to say and trust them to make the right decisions. Yeah. And I'll add, um, be open and be open to getting it wrong. I like that. I like that. Learn to listen and trust and be open to even getting it wrong sometimes. Those are great. Um, And so the next piece of advice is for aspiring leaders. Uh, What would you, what advice would you give them uh, looking to evolve into president and CEO roles as as part of their career path? Let's say they're at the director level right now. I'd say observe, 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 and always try and raise the bar. I love that. Um, And I would add, start to build your team now. You know, what does that look like? To, who do you want to lead with? You know, who do you have such terrific chemistry with that you would say, gosh, if I wake up in the morning every day and I get to work with that person or those people, I could take on anything. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> such good pieces of advice. That was really good. I wish, uh, you know, I wish I was a junior again. I'd be, uh, I'd be looking uh uh, to want to work with uh, either of you, amazing. Well, we have a few open positions, Rob. If you're, yeah, so do we. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I, I spend most of my life as a junior copywriter uh, to this day. So, uh, any junior copywriter positions I'm here. Asha, any parting words before we wrap up? I mean, these. Uh... 
Thank you both for uh, joining us today. As I said before, and I'll say it again, you're both giants, you know, and the teams that uh, get to work underneath you guys um, have a wonderful privilege that they can observe uh, what amazing leadership looks like. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Kachin, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. This was great. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thank you for all your time. I know you, uh, you are busy people. So thank you. And thanks for being such great leaders. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Tune in to LinkedIn. Follow the Disruptor series on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram and listen to us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All right. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Disruptor series podcast, Adweek's agency podcast of the year. Craving more disruption? Visit us at tbwashydayny.com.